Hi, my name is Kevin and I collect old irons. We're talking about the fluter irons here, a very favorite group of mine. And it's a favorite group in part because of the extraordinary variety within the fluters, but also I think that the fluter irons reflect a lot the American psyche, its, um, its, its aspiration and ambition for the latter part of the 19th century. The fluter irons originated in England. Clothes that used the irons that we're talking about here were only worn by the very wealthy, the Downton Abbey set. And yet, these came to the United States and were largely adapted by the middle class. And that produced this enormous variety. So during the time that we're speaking of here, which is the mid-1860s to mid-1880s, a 20-year interval, Americans, particularly the middle class, saw themselves as very much upward mobile. They were going to get richer, they were going to have larger houses, and they might as well get started on that path by, by dressing finer, dressing like the admittedly much higher class people in, in England did. And so that was one of the, the driving mechanisms for the, the fluter irons. The second is the inventors and foundries. Back in that time, we're talking the, the, the time of Edison and, and many other inventors, every fair-sized town had a, an inventor that wanted to strike it rich with, with some great idea. And every fair-sized city had foundries. And these foundries were always looking at something that they could market that would, that, that would enable them to take them up to the, to the next level. So the inventors were putting out patents and the foundries were anxious to put these patents into hardware. And the third factor is this American propensity for efficiency and frugality. We always want to have something that can do this and it can do that. And it strikes us as being able to do things in a simpler, fluid motion for less money. And that is a very important characteristic, I think, of the American mentality. And that brings us to the topic of today's video, which is the combination fluters. We've talked about the hand fluters we talked about the machine fluters in previous videos, but here we want to talk about fluters that did fluting, but also did some other portion of the process of ironing our clothes. In past videos, we have seen that there were many innovations in the world of irons in the late 1860s. The Civil War just, had just ended, and all the manufacturing prowess that we built up during that war was now directed towards the private sector. There were all kinds of new ideas in slug irons and detachable handle irons and fluter irons. In the early 1870s, this developed into the combination irons. And let me let's just start by this one here. This is a Frederick Myers patent, 1871. Frederick Myers, and I, I must mention that he is not the same F. Myers that is famous as an inventor of farm equipment and barn equipment. That's Francis Myers. Frederick Myers, a person very much like Nelson Streeter, who had an eye for uh, something different, something stylish, um, and something that could be marketed as something special. Frederick Myers came up with this flat iron, but this is not just a flat iron. This has a clip that I can take off, and the top comes off to expose a set of brass fluter plates. So it is a flat iron, which I can use as a flat iron, and then I can put my, there's my flat iron, I can take my clip off, I can use it for fluting, I can change it down back to a flat iron again. Exactly. How efficient this was, I'm not sure. Moving this clip and putting it back on while the iron is hot would have been problematic, I think. And if you're gonna wait till it's cool 
and then switch it over. I mean, you might as well be using another iron. Never mind. It was what you could market, I think. So, uh, for our second iron, this is a patent by Myron Knapp, 1870. Uh, and again, there's a little latch here, and this flips forward on a front hinge. Again, we have brass plates. I can do my fluting here, and if I want to then go back to the flat iron, we can do that. By the way, there are several inventors, manufacturers who are uh, coming up with variations on this general kind of, a, of device at about the same time. And let's move to another one. This is the Hyatt patent, um, 1870 also. Uh, Hyatt was from Buffalo, New York. Um, here we have just a flat iron, really, except it's got this, this side plate that's been added to it. It is the top of a fluter. It would be the top plate, the bottom plate, I don't have. The bottom plate's a separate plate. And I have seen and know of three or four or five of these high fluters. None of them have the bottom plate. So, zinc plate here, there would be presumably a zinc bottom plate, which we don't have. But this is a especially rare iron. Uh, this iron's worth three, four hundred dollars just for what you see. It might be worth twice that if you had the bottom plate. So the first three are something of a, a fluting iron combined with a flat iron. The ones we're going to talk about now are ones that have a flat iron to which you can add a piece to add that multiple function. So this is this is just a flat iron here. It could be any flat iron. And you are going to screw, clamp in this bottom piece, which is a top piece for a, for a fluting iron. It has a brass plate down here and fits onto your bottom plate here. And now you can flute. Um, interesting idea. I'm sure that it got marketed to some housewives, not many. This is a rare piece, probably worth a couple three hundred dollars. Um, the issue here, of course, is that once you get this thing bolted into place, you can no longer use this as a flat iron. Um, you've got to use it as this piece. And so maybe you can get all this for cheaper than a separate fluting iron, but I would say probably not. It probably wasn't that effective an idea, and that is reflected in its, in its rarity. So that is the Anderson uh, fluting attachment to a flat iron. 1874 and here is the John Hewitt and the John Hewitt similarly has a a flat iron here and by the way the flat iron here this is the it's called a patent home iron there's various other markings on these you see these fairly commonly you can find the flat iron by itself for 20 or 30 dollars it has a couple of pegs back here and most people don't understand what those pegs are, but those pegs are for you to be able to put in the attachment. I am not going to uh, take the attachment out because this screw is pretty well rusted in place. But you have an attachment you can easily take out, you can put it on, and it fits onto a bottom plate. Interesting idea. Um, apparently common enough, judging again by the, the, the number of flat irons. For the collector, the problem is that the bottom plates get easily lost, the, um, the brackets get easily lost, and so you can find the flat irons, but you can't find the remaining pieces. You might find these two together, finding all three together, very unusual. So the flat iron itself might be worth 20 or 30 dollars, with the bracket, maybe a hundred plus odd dollars. With the bottom piece, maybe two, maybe two hundred and fifty dollars. Um, and there are a lot of these irons that have brackets that you can add to them. So that's the John Hewitt. And while we're talking about John Hewitt, John Hewitt's one of these people that did a, a lot of interesting stuff. This one was an 1873 patent. 
Uh, the one I'm showing you here is an 1872 patent. Notice that all these patents are from the early 1870s. Um, John Hewitt had a rotating iron and the, um, the thumb latch is on the bottom. I can pull this out and I can rotate it. The way these were generally used is you would have a top and bottom flat iron surface, but Hewitt, Hewitt added various permutations on this, various kinds of fluting attachments. Uh, this one right here, let me just take this off so you can see how easily it comes off. There are a couple of holes on each side. Uh, this is called Patent John Hewitt, 1872. I'll put that back on. Again, not something that's very easily done while the iron is hot, so I'm really not thinking that this was done as fluting and a flat iron, you know, one after the other. So you wonder exactly what the advantage might be. And the uh, bottom piece, and these come in, in various sizes, but this is a a wood piece with a galvanized metal plate on top of it. Again, you oftentimes see the irons separated from the attachments, separated from the bottom plates. The iron itself might have a value in the 50, 60, 70, maybe higher if it's especially good condition, but all these combined might be 200 plus dollars. So again, part of the story here is that we're dealing here with relatively uncommon to rare pieces and there are sundry miscellaneous parts that the experienced iron collector is looking for. And I know that we have some antique shop pickers that are starting to watch these videos and they're looking for these things as well. If you have the base plate, this base plate in the company of the iron doubles the value of the iron and therefore if the person can recognize this and get it to the right person such as me they can make a whole lot more money so again this is the john hewitt rotating iron with the bottom plate and we'll go to a in some sense similar piece this is the butters patent 1866 and this is a slug iron. Let me just go ahead and remind you how a slug iron works. There is a, a slug in here. Uh, slugs uh, were quite popular in the 1860s or so. They're always a little bit sometimes hard to open and close. I have one just like this, but it doesn't have the two indentations on the sides here. Um, this one does have those indentations. It's a later variant. It has a attachment here that is very much like the John Hewitt attachment we see on that one, except that this has a different patentee. And I, somebody's infringing on somebody else's patent is my interpretation of this. And there was a lot of that going on back in those times. But here is the plate. I'll take this off. Uh, no markings here. The patentee had the markings on the bottom plate. This is the S.D. Hubbard from Pittsburgh. That'll bring us to the little giant. So we have now looked at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven combination fluter irons, all from the first half of the 1870s, all trying to sell that this can do this and this can do that. All of them being hand fluters and flat irons. Um, this one might be the most successful of the lot. It is from 1873. It is the Mooney patent and it is the Little Giant. And I have a couple of them here. This is not a, a flat iron per se. Uh, this is rounded on the bottom. This is a polishing iron. And the idea here, uh, very small iron, uh, I can do some fluting around the frills of a dress, and while it's hot, I can then, this is my interpretation, hit some of the, the 
pieces between the frills and I suspect that there might have been some particular style of dress of that period for which this particular iron had its niche. If you were going to have this dress or be ironing this dress you had to have the right iron. They are again fairly uncommon but there's a lot of them out there. They come in different sizes. Uh, this one here has seven flutes on it. Here's a smaller one that has five flutes. There's a, a six flute variation as well. They have different kinds of handles. They have different kinds of markings. And they have different kinds of bottoms as well. Uh, this one has a, a just a simple wood piece. There never was a galvanized or otherwise metal sheathing to this. This one, and, and by the way, the, the wood base is the more common situation. This one is one I just got at an auction a few months ago, has a, a cast metal piece here that you can flute with. So these are fairly unusual, but also in the 1870s. We now have had eight irons from the 1870s. Here's what I think was going on. In the latter part of the 1860s, there was a lot of innovation, a lot of new ideas, and more of that in the 1870s. But as the 1870s were developing, the, the iron is going to be, in some sense or another, replacing most of these irons as a very practical, sad iron, the Mrs. Potts. Mrs. Potts has been patented in 1870, 1871, but it took a few years to gain some steam and to, and to find its, its marketing niche. But by the 18, mid 1870s, these things are going on and these others are sliding away. There still was a need for fluting irons and that is when the, the Best and the Shepherd and the Crown and some of these other hand and machine fluters then came out in large numbers. So what we're looking at here these combination fluters are something of in between the, the initial blast of fluting patents and then the very focused fluting irons of the late 1870s. By the early 1880s, these things are starting to fade away. Why? Costumes have changed. Fashion has, has done its thing and people are getting a little tired of all the absurdity that we've been having to go through with all this Victorian fluff and we are even while Queen Victoria is still alive we're starting to to segue into the Edwardian period. So that is sort of the history of the fluters in a nutshell. Um, came in in the 1860s, they developed with wild innovation in the mid-1870s, settled down to a number of very common designs in the late 1870s, and then pretty much faded away in the early 1880s. But there still was ruffles going on, and we still had this propensity to add ruffles to our clothing and so forth. We were still ruffling. To some degree, the Geneva Fluter and the Shepherd and the uh, American Machine Company products and so forth, these continued, as we've seen in the Sears Roebuck catalog 1902, into the 20th century. Although it's worth noting that they're not there in the, in the 1908 catalog. But during that interim, very little in the way of new designs, but there still are some combination fluters coming around because we are still looking for the hey, you know, I want something that does ironing, but I got a little bit of ruffling that I want to do as well. Um, this is a Fox Sat Iron Company product. I've got it in the original box. Uh, this was restored by Richard Gillis, a good friend of mine. And let me pull this out. And it's a tight fit. This is a, another rotating iron. Our next video is going to be on rotating irons, so we'll talk about them in, in greater detail then. But this is a specially interesting product. Um, 
Again, I can rotate it. It's got a top plate, a bottom plate, it's got a polishing plate, and it's got a fluter plate. I have a bottom plate, but it's with another iron, and I'll leave that there. The tank here, originally alcohol in the 1880s. This has an 1882 patent, but there is a improved patent in 1887 and then one in 1904. So this one has a particularly long history. I think this was alcohol originally and then went into gasoline in the 1890s, maybe early 20th century as gasoline becomes more readily available. So this is a fancy and used for a fairly long period of time. I've actually seen some of these selling at the auctions for only three or four hundred dollars so it's it's not overly rare a lot of the major collectors have have them so those of us that are just getting into the process can get still get these at a relatively modest cost for the the impact that uh, iron like this has oh and by the way so I can iron with it or I can let's see now I can cook with it as well. And these were these were advertised as something that you could look at use in the sick house where you need to, you know, serve your your ailing mom with a little bit of tea and so forth, far away from your stove and so forth. So there was a niche for these. And here's another late combination fluter. This is uh, Harold Carver from 1899. We actually saw one of these before, not the same ones. I uh, do not show the same iron twice in these videos, but I have several of these, and they're each different. Um, and let's just remind ourselves that this is a slug. I have to get that lined up. That opens the door. I do have, this is the original handle for the uh, lifter here. This has now been, been copied and so that more people can have a genuine copy of the original. And just telling some of you out there where your copy came from. Another Richard Gillis recreation. So we have a slug fluter. I can rotate it and I have the bottom plate as well. This is the uh, Majestic Fluter, 1899, um, fairly uncommon, however, I will tell you that at an auction two years ago, late in the auction, this thing came up and I got it for $160. So if you are patient at these auctions, you can get something late in the business for a especially good price. Again, the Majestic Fluter. And with that, we're going to go to the final major piece of our video here. And we're going to go back to Frederick Myers. Now, we started with a Frederick Myers piece. He was a person that came up with all kinds of interesting, stylish ideas. This is an 1873 patent. And this is an embossing iron. It has a little latch on the front opens on a hinge on the front and I have here I have some fluter plates now the interesting thing here is I can actually take the fluter plates out and I can put some attachments in uh, attachments that might impress designs we call that bossing embossing and I can put that in here latch that thing in and I can now do my embossing and then if I want to I can do some ironing with it as well. Now whether we needed to go through all those motions doing all that stuff with one iron and not several irons I'm not sure. Um, this I know people do like to know something about the general values. This is another piece that I got late in the same auction as the last piece. Um, 
and I paid $400 for this and the various uh, sundry other plates as well. I have one here that embosses in a nice little triangular design. So with that, we are basically done with this talk about what is in a sense a relatively minor group, an uncommon group, one that you're not going to see very often. I will pull this one out. This is an iron we did see in our first video. This is the most common combination fluter. Uh, this particular one you can oftentimes find for uh, maybe 20, maybe 40 or more dollars. Everything else here in the 100 to several hundred dollars, they're the iron that we're looking for. When we're in the antique shops and we're looking at the box lots of the auctions, these things are out there. And what you've seen here, as always, is the tip of the iceberg. There are many other kinds out there. Some well known, and there's always surprises. So with that, and to take a look at some more surprisingly interesting irons, I will see you in another video. Thank you very much.